Talk Recorded live. Hello and a warm welcome to everybody who's listening. This is Jogler 66, or Jörg Glissmann from the YouTube channel Jogler 66. And we are here together this evening to have a, another broadcast on the topic, the characteristics of Antichrist, that we have taken from the website remnantofgod.org. There has been already another broadcast on the first two characteristics uh, a week or two ago that you probably have heard. If you didn't, then go to the archives and please listen to that. And I'm glad to welcome two guests to me uh, with me on the show tonight. This is, uh, first of all, Walt Stickel from the website GrandDesignExposed.com, a website full of information on the Vatican, on the Jesuits, on the Second Beast, on prophecy and on studying the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the history of the Jesuits, the involvement of uh, the founding of them in uh, 1776, the founding of the United States of America. Welcome, Walt. Thanks, and glad to be here, uh, York. Glad to have you, Walt. Yeah. And my other guest is uh, Tom Fress, who you already know from uh, earlier broadcasts also from the website uh, Inquisition update, and you know him otherwise from First Mountain Radio or Ham Radio. He has been all over the internet spreading the word of Christ for the last at least 15 years, often being attacked like the Bible, but never given up. Tom, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for having me, Yerk, and I'm happy to be here and anxious to get to, to resume our study. Then I will not lose any more words on anything else, but just go right into the topic. Uh, for those who have been following this, we are discussing the characteristics of Antichrist as Nicholas from RemnantOfGod.org put them together in a wonderful web page and also in a PDF book that you can follow in the read. Um, this PDF book contains 123 pages, and we are now on uh, page 13 of the PDF or seven in the book, if you want to read it like that. And the next characteristics that we are going to talk through are today characteristic number three, which is called the Antichrist is both political and a religious power. Then afterwards we will, will go on to that Antichrist will have his church and state sit on seven hills. That is characteristic number four. And characteristic number five is that the Antichrist is to rule the world for 1260 years. Now, where do we take these characteristics from? The Bible, and the Bible alone. And all we that are here together in this call, we assure you, we take the King James Version of 1611 as our book of authority. We don't read any other Bibles except for exposing them as being false doctrine. We follow the King James Bible and only the King James Bible. And you can have a discussion with us on that, if that is all right or not all right. Many people have different meanings of this. But in our common opinion, the King James Bible is the only preserved word of God that is available today in our times as it was meant by God to be read. You can have another meaning of that, but you are entitled to your own meaning. But there is a lot of proof on there, out, out there when you go into the Internet and do research that that is the way. And that is also why the King James Bible always is being attacked by people who don't like it so much. And who are these people? Well, <laughs> I think we will go into that later this evening. Anyway, I'm going to start <clears throat> reading uh, characteristic number three, that Antichrist is both a political and religious power. And we will prove that to you by, among others, starting reading in Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, quote, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, end quote. Therefore, <clears throat> it is interesting to see that Revelation 17, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. What does it mean by wilderness? A wilderness in the Bible means a place where there is the God of work not around. And there he saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. What defines a woman? We go right into this. In prophecy, 
a woman is defined as a church. And to understand that, you read Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2, that says, quote, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, end quote. We also understand the church of Jesus Christ is considered to be the bride of Christ because of many areas of scriptures that describe her as such. It's only commonly understood that prophecy defines a beast to be a nation. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, we learn that, quote, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth, end quote. And it continues in verse 23, quote, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be different, uh, diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces, end quote. Now, even in today's world, nations are described as beasts. Well, the United States of America is seen as an eagle. Russia is likened unto a bear. And China even carries the image of a dragon. And you know what the dragon stands for in Bible prophecy, I guess. Many years ago, Daniel was given a great vision about all the nations of the earth till the end of time. In this version, he saw, <coughs> sorry, he saw the last piece to be, quote, unquote, diverse from all the others, at, uh, from uh, Daniel 7:19. But how diverse would it be? According to Revelation 17, verse 3, as we have already seen, this beast will have a woman riding it, since prophecy defines a woman as a church and a beast as a nation. Is there such an entity described in history? Is there a church and state mixed together as one same, uh, as one same place today? Yes, there is. Only one place on earth has ever done this. The Vatican of the Roman Catholic Church has been established upon this type of union and is now finalizing plans to use this prophesied church and state structure to obtain global rule in the place of pagan Rome. This finishes characteristic number three. It was quite a short one, but nevertheless, it is quite a powerful one, and I think there are a lot of things that Tom and I and Eden Walt would like to discuss about the identifying the woman as a church and especially identifying a beast or uh, as a kingdom. Tom, please share with us your thoughts. Yes, well, it is indisputable in the Christian world today, the interpretation of these four beasts that Daniel mentions. Uh, first, Medo-Persia, which, or excuse me, rather, Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar, we read in the book of Daniel, and they were defeated by the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. And then they were conquered by Greece, by the Greek Empire. And then the fourth and final beast upon the earth is the Roman Empire. And Daniel clearly lays out in his vision that that empire will continue until Christ returns. And what makes this fourth and final world empire, this Gentile world empire, so unique is that it is a church and a state. It's not just a state. Daniel clearly lays out what makes this kingdom, this king and this kingdom, unique in all world history is that it is a hermetic union between church and state. Now, it should ring a bell to Americans, at least. In our Constitution, we have a separation of church and state a non-establishment clause that says the government shall not establish a religion in this country. It also guarantees the right of religious liberty, that we should have freedom of conscience to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Now, Christians uh, worship God according to the written word of God, the Bible. But this was to be a religiously free nation. And the government was to keep its hands off of religion, a separation of church and state. But that's not what characterizes the Roman Empire. 
the Roman Empire was created from its foundation as a union of church and state. And Daniel makes this perfectly clear, and it makes, well, it makes it possible to make an unmistakable identity as to who this is. Unique in all the world is the Roman Catholic Church state, and it is the head, the governing authority of this Roman Empire that we have to admit, if we believe Daniel, if we believe the Word of God, it is the power that rules the world today. Now, many will say, well, Tom, that's impossible. I mean, uh, there can't be just four world empires. After all, there was the Japanese Empire. There's the British Empire. But look at history. Rome has conquered them all. The United States of America, a land that was once believed and for the most part truly was a Protestant nation, has literally and has functioned almost throughout its entire history as the battle axe, the military battle axe for this Roman Empire and has conquered the Japanese Empire. And anyone who's familiar with the religious history of England, the British Empire realizes that Rome has had control of the British Empire. And in reality, it's not a Protestant nation. It's a Roman Catholic nation. At least we can say this, that the square mile within the city of London called London, I refer to it as London proper, uh, the very authority within the city of, of, of London that is one square mile, and it, it is the seat of the British government. In other words, the Queen of England, when she enters that city, she must have permission by the Lord Mayor of London proper. And that's where the Vatican banks are, Lloyds of London, the, the seat of British Freemasonry, the seat of, of Roman Catholic Jesuitism. It is literally the financial center of the world. And it is disingenuous to say, it is contrary to Scripture to say, that the world is not controlled by this Roman Empire. To say that Rome does not control both the United States, Great Britain, Australia, the European Union, even China, is to say that Daniel and the Bible is a liar. Now, it took me a long time to comprehend this, but for a long time, I have to admit, I did not believe what the Bible said. I didn't understand it. Let me put it that way. I didn't understand it. I didn't comprehend. But it is true that Rome literally controls the whole world, and it has tread it down and broke it in pieces. Now, anybody who has done uh, uh, this research understands that there's an organization called the Club of Rome, which is a think tank for the Vatican, and it was their job to set up the framework, the basis for this new global religion, this new global social system, this new global uh, economic system, a, a new world order, essentially. And it was the Club of Rome that broke up the world into ten regions. In other words, essentially doing away with the existing borders of the nations and redrawing the borders of the nations. Now there are not hundreds of nations in the world, but ten. Of course, they've allowed the people to believe that their national, their national boundaries still exist and that they have national sovereignty, but nothing could be further from the truth. All nations are losing their sovereignty. They are being molded and shaped to fit into the new boundaries established by the Club of Rome. And over each one of these ten regions will be instituted a supreme governor who will operate and, and uh, govern, essentially, 
each one of those ten regions under the authority of the papacy. Can I say something, Tom? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I very much like to turn the attention of our listeners here to the European Union, because the European Union consists at the moment, I think, of 28 different states. And it started out as an economic union, as a coal union, in fact, that was the first. And then followed the, uh, the, the economic union, and then followed the EG, so-called EG, the European, uh, I don't know what, what, what the name was anymore. And now today, today we have the so-called the EU. This is the first of the ten kingdoms that really comes into existence before our very eyes, as the first uh, as, as the first kingdom to be completed, and in the United States of America, you have since uh, a few years already these North American trade trade, trade agreements uh, uh, thing going on. I don't know the exact name of that right now, but that is the uh, merging of the United States of America together with Canada and Mexico, and this will be the, uh, another kingdom that is there. Then you can see that in the military, the United States of America um, already divided like uh, Africa, and they have just uh, Africom, and those are the kingdoms to come. You can, when when you get to the Club of Rome and the leaked paper of 1973 or 1976, it was where this uh, confidential report of the working of the Club of Rome leaked into the public with those ten kingdoms, you can Google that and look that up, and then you will actually see the way the world is working today, coming these kingdoms into existence. And the EU is the first being finished in that way. We already had our first president of the EU, a man no citizen in this European Union ever voted for, the former Belgian Prime Minister, uh, Hermann von Rompuy. And he was the president of the European Council, and by that he was the president of the EU for the last few years. Just wanted to intervene that, Tom, but please carry on. Oh, yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I found all of this startling when I first finally comprehended it. Uh, they used a, uh, an irresistible bait to get people to accept these new nations created by the Club of Rome, they used the promise of, of, of economic bounty, okay, economic wealth, uh, trade agreements, cooperation in trade. And, of course, uh, that was irresistible. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted economic strength. They wanted to achieve the benefits of their union for economic strength and also for national security. If we have mutual agreements in trade, the natural progression of that is mutual agreements in law under which trade is conducted, and then international agreements with, it, with regard to, to self-defense. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and and uh, sorry to interrupt you here again, but you have to, to understand something when you understand history especially the history of Europe, where it all comes from. Europe has always, the last 2,000 years, greatly been divided, greatly been divided into national states, all with their own goal. And by taking the work on to first unite Europe, the Vatican is really working on the hardest merger they have to do all around the world. There won't be such a big problem to merge all the countries in the continent of Africa. There won't be such a big problem to merge the countries of the northern continent of America, Canada, United States, and Mexico. But it has worked in the European Union where the, the, all the different states, 28 are named, which are now in the EU, they all have a very, very distinctive culture on themselves. And if they are prepared to throw that culture overboard to join this Roman Catholic system, then the major work of the Roman Catholic Church has been done, because when it can be done in Europe, it can be done anywhere. Yes, that's exactly right. And the European Union has literally become a Roman Catholic superstate. It's, just, it's been created by the Vatican. 
through the cult, the club of Rome. And the natural progression began with the promise of economic boom, then to uh, create not only this economic boom, but national security and defense agreements and a common law for all these nations within the EU. The natural progression of that is a, a, a new government. And what we see in these 10 regions as they have evolved, as each nation has essentially surrendered their sovereignty and become just a state within a nation, what they've literally done is consolidated all political power under one entity that Rome controls because it was her creation. The Vatican controls these governments, just as the Bible says. Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes, and this is not for the good of Christians. This is good for the Roman Catholic Church, and this is good for the papacy. The beast, as described by the Bible, but this is not good for God's people. And uh, look, we need to refresh the memories of God's people that there was a time many, many years ago when Satan had united all the people of the world to obey a single man. And at that time, they sought to build a tower that would reach up into heaven in defiance of God's command to be fruitful and spread out and fill the earth after the flood. Instead, they gathered themselves together in the plains, united all the people in a project in rebellion against God to not spread out all over the world, to replenish the world after the flood, but to stay in one place, build cities, and build a tower in abject rebellion against the Creator. And they served a single man. I call him the first pope in the world after the flood, Nimrod. And God saw what men were, were doing. And in, to enforce his commandment, he went down and confounded their languages. Now, the result of that was the creation of the nations. Those who spoke a similar language obviously congregated to one another and then moved off as God originally commanded and established their own nations. They had their own languages, their own nations, their own governments. And literally, God accomplished what he instructed man to do, to, to spread out and fill the earth and not be united all together in rebellion against the Creator and to serve a man. And what are we seeing today? The nations that God scattered. Governments that they established. Languages that God gave them to make them separate and unique are now all coming together under the authority of a single man to create another abomination on the earth in abject rebellion against the Creator. And it's called the New World Order. And the EU is simply one of those ten nations. But we have to understand that Rome controls them all. What we have... What we have uh, uh, formulating right before our very eyes is a global Babylon. A global Babylon. Now, does it make sense when the Bible speaks of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? Who is the mother of harlots? First of all, what is a harlot? 
A harlot is one who has departed from the truth, departed from the pristine worship of the creator of all heaven and earth, a woman who has prostituted herself to false gods, images, idols, idolatry, spiritual idolatry, spiritual adultery. Mother of harlots. Who is the mother of all these who have departed the faith of Jesus Christ in the Bible and are now, in the name of Christianity, bowing down to one man on the earth, obeying one man on the earth? It's all the nations of the world. I watched a video on YouTube last night, headline after headline after headline, that has been going on for decades. The religions of the world coming to the Vatican to seek spiritual unity with the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Pontiff. We see politicians from every corner of the world dressed in black, and their wives that they attend with them, they wear a black dress with a black veil over their face, and they kiss the Pope's ring. Is this not exactly what the Bible is predicting here? a global rebellion against the creator of all heaven and earth to serve one man. And the EU was created by the threat of economic blessing. Then it was economic law. Then it was civil law. Then it, all pretense of national sovereignty literally disappeared It has now become one nation, and all of it was created by the Vatican. Likewise with the uh, the United States, we we were promised economic uh, benefit by getting into trade agreements. And likewise, we have literally surrendered our national sovereignty. Our Constitution literally is just a wasted piece of paper. They don't acknowledge it at all anymore. They're taking away all of our rights, and we're literally coming under a new authority. The President of the United States doesn't have autonomy in this in this country. He doesn't have uh, – everybody come to the realization the President of the United States is just a puppet. He takes his orders from somebody else. Well, the Bible tells us who that somebody else is. It's the beast, the Roman beast and more particularly, the woman that rides that beast, the Roman Catholic Church. And we see example after example after example, even now in the mainstream media, the bishops' conferences of the Roman Catholic Church getting together. They're politically active. They are a political juggernaut. They can't be, they can't be contradicted. They can't be defeated in politics in this country, especially since Vatican Council II in 1965 when the Protestants, who now believe in futurism, they don't believe the Pope's the Antichrist anymore, literally united with the Roman Catholic Church. And now they have a political juggernaut that is unprecedented in the history of this country. They literally, they literally control not only, not only our internal laws, but they control our foreign policies. And if Roman Catholic bishops and Roman Catholic Jesuits, together with their ecumenical Protestant counterparts, and you can't even use the name Protestant to describe them, they don't protest Rome anymore. They are literally setting the agenda for this country. And who are they obeying? Are they obeying the God of the Bible? Or are are they obeying the self-proclaimed God of this world, the Pope of Rome? The whole world wanders after the beast, just like the Bible says. It's evident. It's facts on the ground, observable facts on the ground. Nobody can deny this except one who wishes to deceive himself. Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And, of course, all attention is put on Israel, as though that were Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Everyone is 
is has their eyes on Israel, and while their eyes are diverted toward Israel, Rome has taken over the house. The Antichrist, the beast of Daniel, the beast of Revelation, has taken over the world, religiously and politically. And it's time for this world to wake up to that reality. If we cannot comprehend or will not re- comprehend that Rome rules this world, lock, stock, and barrel, then we make Daniel and the Bible a liar. And I must believe Daniel, <clears throat> and I must believe the Bible, and I must, I cannot deny the visible facts on the ground. When you see Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before your very eyes, it's not good to deny the undeniable. Well, the proof on the ground that you were just stating, Tom, I just want to elaborate a little bit on that. When you go to Google and you Google in Google Pictures, for example, the Tower of Babel, there is a picture out there that you will see that shows the ancient Tower of Babel as it was built in Babylon that Tom just described a few minutes ago. And next to it, there is a picture of Europe today, where there is also a building of a tower, like the Tower of Babel, on the top surrounded by 12 inverted pentagrams, stars, with the top down, with the, with the arrow uh, down, which is the uh, satanic meaning of the pentagram, because you also have the star pointing up, that is the Luciferian, and you have the star pointing down, that is the satanic one. And beneath that picture, it says, Europe, many tongues, one voice. If you look for any more proof right before your eyes, then Google the city of Strasbourg in the north of France, where the European Parliament sits, and look at that building. It is exactly a replica of the Tower of Babel. You don't need any more proof than that. It's right before there in your eyes. You can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it. Sorry, Tom, what, please go what on. Is, what, is absolute, what is absolutely remarkable about this is there's no pretense of disguising what they're doing. To make their parliament building fashioned after the likeness of the Tower of Babel, there's no, there's, they're, they're coming out in the open, what they're doing. The, the, the structure of that building is designed that way to send a message. The Tower of Babel is being rebuilt. And Christians better take a warning. To rebuild Babel, to rebuild Babylon, is to rebel against the Creator to unify all the nations together, to serve a man, is to commit once again that abomination that occurred right after the flood. And uh, the Bible predicts this. We're seeing it taking place, and we must be on our faces in repentance. We cannot be a part of this global Babylon we have to decide, each and every one of us have to make a decision who we're going to serve. Shall we serve a wicked man? One of the most diabolical institutions in the history of the world. Now, most people aren't aware of the history of the papacy. I recommend a book, <clears throat> Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy. I could, rem- I could recommend a dozen other books that outlined the, the, the history of the abominations of the popes themselves who claimed to be the vicars of Christ, the replacement of Christ on earth. Even the name, even the title of the pope is blasphemy. There's but one who replaced Christ when he ascended into heaven to be with his father, to sit upon his throne and to make intercession for us. There was but one who replaced him on the earth, and that was the Holy Spirit. He said, if I go away, I will send the Comforter, and he will teach you all things. But what is this vicar of Christ? 
he arrogates to himself the prerogatives of God, the seat and throne of God and his authority, and only he may teach truth. That is Roman Catholic canon law. It is established by Roman Catholic canon law that only the Pope may instruct the, the world. Roman Catholic canon law also stipulates that the, that the papacy is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. In papal bull entitled Unum Sanctum by Pope Boniface VIII, he said, it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject, be subject to the Roman pontiff. Isn't that what we see today? The governments of the world literally being fashioned into an image identical to what took place right after the flood? The whole world literally does wonder after the beast. And when you start, just, and when you start examining the civil laws of this country, you'll find out that they are imposing through the civil law, through the legislative branch of our country, the Congress, they are passing laws that uphold Roman Catholic canon law. And I'll just give you two examples, the NDAA and the, the Patriot Act, and all these other presidential directives. The, the, the president of the United States no longer is a president. He, he governs this country by fiat. Presidential directives. It's never established in the Constitution that the president of the United States is autonomous and can pass laws just by the volition of his, of his, of his mind. The American people, if there were any sanity among the citizens of this country, would be an outrage when the president stands up and makes a decree like a king or even ask the question, is he really a king? What, what, function, <clears throat> what function does the legislature play? They simply rubber stamp these presidential decrees. Look, in essence, what we see on a global scale, not just the United States, not just the EU, but all these other 10 regions that were created by the Club of Rome is political and religious concentration of power, consolidation of power. Now there are not <clears throat> uh, a hundred and some odd independent sovereign governments of the world that the papacy has to control. No, they've consolidated them all down to 10. The papacy only has to control 10 kings. And if you're a reader of the Bible and you love to read the Bible, read Revelation chapter 17 and listen to what he says about those 10 kings. They make war with the Lamb of God. How does ten nations of the world make war against the Lamb of God when they are mortal and carnal, but he is spiritual? They simply make war against God's people. That's how you make war with the Lamb of God. That's how the ten kings of the earth make war against the Lamb of God, by making war against his people and forcing them into a ten-nation conglomerate under the authority of a single man. That's how you make war against the Lamb of God. It says they shall make war against the Lamb of God, but the Lamb of God shall overcome them, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Not the Pope, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it also says, and these ten kings shall hate the whore, and shall make her naked and desolate, 
and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For strong is the Lord that punishes her. Eventually, these ten kings are going to see that they serve a man and not the vicar of Christ, but Antichrist. And they will repent. And they will stop making war against the Lamb of God. Stop killing his people. And then they will unite in hatred against this whore, this Roman Catholic Church, this Vatican power that has incited them against God's holy people, realizing now for the first time that he is not the vicar of Christ, he's the vicar of Satan himself. And they've made war against God's people. They've made war against heaven. And in an attempt, a failed attempt to make restitution to the God of glory, the real King of kings and the Lord of lords, they will destroy the Roman Catholic Church. They will consume her. They will burn her down to the ground. But that won't happen until the woman that rides the scarlet-colored beast, who is now in control of these ten global nations, these ten kingdoms, this consolidated power, this this monstrous Babylon that they've created, only after they have made war against God's people will they comprehend the sin, the incomprehensible sin that they have committed against the lawful throne of heaven. There's a global slaughter about to take place. And what about America? A nation once Protestant that knew that the papacy was the Antichrist, that protested the Antichrist of the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church. What about Protestant America? They, too, have surrendered their Protestant knowledge and have united with this beast in Rome under the ecumenical movement. Judgment is going to come to this country. A national Christian rebellion against the God of the Bible. They've made the Vatican their God. They've made government their God. And for their, from their God, they depend on everything. Health care, financial independence, national, international sovereignties. They depend on the government. They don't depend on God. They depend on insurance companies. They don't depend on, on clean and godly living. A national rebellion. That's the only way you can describe the United States of America today, post-Vatican Council II. National rebellion against the one who's blessed us ever since our founding. What thanks the American people, called Christian, have given to their Savior by uniting with the Antichrist of the Bible under the promise, the meager promise of economic bounty. And what did we see when we signed those ecumenical agreements in, in 1965 at Vatican Council II? We've seen the wealth of this country disappear in debt, in war, in, in immigration, in... They've shipped out all the good jobs. The papacy is coming to this country this fall, September 24th. Jorge Bergoglio, the author of the, the Dirty War in Argentina back in the 80s, a mass murderer and a pedophile protector global priest pedophilia all over this world hundreds of thousands of little kids abused by these demons from hell called roman catholic priests he's the head of them all they obey him and no one else and he is coming to address a joint session of congress in september 24th not if there was one shred of protestantism left in this country would it happen The literal beast of the Bible 
The Antichrist is coming to address a joint session of the lawmakers of this land. What do you think they're going to do after they've been blessed by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist? I'll tell you what they're going to do, just like what the Bible says. They make war against the Lamb of God by making war against his people. There's an inquisition coming to the United States, the likes of which we can't even comprehend. They're going to make us sign our souls to secure health care. And if we rebel, we're not going to have health care. And besides that, we're going to be taxed to death and fined for not joining this diabolical system. You're not going to have access to your bank account if you don't go along with this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Do I sound angry? Maybe I should not be angry. But I don't see how I cannot be angry when I now realize that my pastors and teachers all throughout my Christian life never told me one word about this. They never even told me the papacy was the Antichrist. They never told me what the Protestant reformers believed. They never showed me how the Bible prophecy about the Antichrist, the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is all fulfilled. Every single one of them in only the papacy can't be anybody else. They never told me that the papacy rules over Washington, D.C. And the, and the laws that are passed. Even the Supreme Court, now for the first time in the history of this country, is seven, count them, seven Roman Catholics. Many of them belong to the most the most conservative Roman Catholic organization called Opus Dei. Warriors for the Pope, sworn, oath-spitting warriors for the Pope. And there's only two Jews to fill up the bench. Seven Roman Catholics and two Jews sit on the, seven, on the, on the Supreme Court of this country. But that's not the worst of it. You want to hear the worst of it? For the first time in the history of this country, there is not one single Protestant on that court. That's the worst of it. There's not one single Protestant on that court. The Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible, has seven representatives on that, on that, on that court. And there's not one Protestant on the court to protest Rome's agenda for this country. That ought to make the hair stand on the back of your neck. If you have any comprehension about history, that ought to give you nightmares. And you know what the Supreme Court does? What the duty of the Supreme Court is in this country? To interpret the Constitution. And what do you see happening to the Constitution? What do you see happening to freedom of speech, freedom of the press? Everybody admits now the press is controlled. They don't tell us the truth. What do you see about religious liberty? You see churches burning, Waco. You see Ruby Ridge. You see Tony Alamo Christian Ministries. You know what's unique about them? They wouldn't accept the Pope as their king. Frightening, isn't it? Makes you angry, doesn't it? If you comprehend it, it makes you angry. Uh, I could go on a month. I think I've made my point. I think the Bible has made the point. I think God has made the point. I think Daniel has made the point. I think the Protestant reformers made the point. The papacy is the Antichrist, and we are in bed with her up to our necks. And we have no way out. 
the only hope for God's people in this country is the same hope, the only hope the Israelites had when they were in Egyptian bondage. Deliverance. Deliverance. Let my people go so that they may come and worship me, not a man. And I'm getting prepared for that day. I'm shaking loose the Roman chains of bondage. I'm shaking off these iron chains. I am no longer loyal to a disloyal, apostate, rebellious nation. I am no longer subject to the government of men. I am subject to the holy God of creation. It's the only hope I have. Who cares if I live or die, if I die worshiping the beast? This mortal must take on immortality. I'm going to die, but I'll tell you something else. I'm going to die worshiping my God and no one else. And obedience is the most pristine form of worship. All your holy days, all your churches, all your Sabbaths, all your prayers, everything is second to obedience. I would have obedience and not sacrifice. Back to you, Yurt. Oh, thank you, Tom, for another, again, wonderful and powerful statement that you brought up here. And I think we haven't exhausted this. I think it is about the smallest point of this 26 characteristics of Antichrist. But as you said, you could go on for a month and I could join you because there's so much more to tell. But before we go on to the next point, I will just emphasize another point that was in this characteristics that we have not been spoken of that much, and that is also very important, I think. And that is when we read Daniel 17, uh, 7, verse 23. Just a small quote of that. The fourth beast shall be diverse from all kingdoms. What is the diversity this fourth kingdom shows of all the other kingdoms that have been before it? That is the church and state are mingled together. That is what, when you see the statue that was built in Babylon to honor Nebuchadnezzar, and when you see these four kingdoms, I mean, that's not the statue because the statue of Nebuchadnezzar was pure gold, but when you have the statue that you know is biblical, with the golden head, the silver arms, the, uh, the bronze breast, and the iron legs, and the iron legs stand on iron foot mixed with miry clay. That is the mixing of civil or temporal and spiritual power. This fourth beast is different from all beasts before it because church and state are not separated. And if you want to have proof of that, just go to your congregation, wherever you are in the United States of America, and check if your congregation has signed a tech exempt form called 501c3. That was very hard pushed by President George W. Bush in 2006. And today, almost everyone, I mean, I, I cannot speak for every church because I don't know that, but the majority, the big majority of all congregations in the United States are 501c3 organizations. And what does it imply to be a 501c3 organization? It implies that you are, or your congregation now represents, a governmental agency. That also implies that your church is not allowed in a certain way to speak a bet against the government because you cannot bite the hand that feeds you. And that is the way to shut the spiritual 
movement, if there was any to begin with, totally up and totally control the spiritual movement, totally control all the churches. It doesn't matter if it's a Baptist church, if it is a First Methodist church, if it is Seventh-day Adventist church, or whatever congregation you have over there, or Lutheran, or Baptist, I, I, I don't know all the different names, I don't care for. Look it up for yourself, and check it out. They are all 501c3 organizations. And by that, they are government controlled. And that is what diverses this fourth beast from all the others, where church and state were separate. The kings had next to him, next to them, priests, or even druids, or whatever, but they had spiritual leaders next to them. And the Pope, sitting in Rome, is the only one in world history that always combined church and state. That is why you have on the Vatican flag the two crossing keys. The golden key standing for the spiritual leadership and the silver key standing for um, the temporal or civil leadership the Vatican represents. And that has been told to us by Daniel now 2,500 years ago. He saw all that coming. Maybe, Walt, you have a little comment on that? Or Tom? I think it's well stated. I've uh, I've breathed up a lot of air, but you described the, the, the uniqueness of the Roman Catholic Church state. It is both a church and a state, and it claims divine authority over all the churches. Not just Roman Catholic churches, all the churches. Roman Catholic canon law stipulates that if you've been baptized by water, you are subject to the Roman pontiff. That means your churches, your local churches, have kept that secret from you. Have you been baptized in water? Do you know who commanded us to be baptized? Jesus. Yet the Pope asserts himself over Jesus and says, if you have been baptized by water in whatever church, you are a subject of the Roman pontiff. It's unique in all the world. And it can command the civil power, the governments of the world, to enforce her canon law. That is what you get when you get a church-state union. That's why our founders understood the Protestant view that if they allowed church and state to be united in this country, the Pope would rule. We wouldn't have a president. We wouldn't have a Congress. We would have a Roman dictator. And if for proof of this, we, we all have to remember, some of us who are old enough to remember, the first Roman Catholic president in this country was John F. Kennedy. And there was a Protestant block against his presidency. They liked him. They wanted to vote for him. But they needed from him a guarantee that if he was going to sit in the Oval Office, he would not allow the Pope to run his government. He would not allow the Pope to be the clandestine king of the United States of America. He would not, re he would not uh, allow the Oval Office to become a vassal of the papacy. And John F. Kennedy had to go around this country and guarantee the Protestants that he would not allow the Vatican to run his government, that he was an American president, not a Roman president. And so they voted for him. But that's not the case today. The presidents of the United States get on Air Force One, and they literally just kick her in the flanks and she goes to Rome all on her own. She's been there so many times, she knows her way by heart. Just like an old horse knows her way to the barn, Air Force One knows her way to Rome. And every president since John F. Kennedy have made a trip to the Vatican and have had private meetings with the popes. 
information exchanging hands, orders changing hands that the American people were never made privy to. Why do the presidents of the United States, elected by the people of this country, why do the presidents of the United States go to Rome wearing black and veils and kissing the ring of the Pope on their knees? Why do they meet the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, in private session? What do you think they talk about? You don't think they're exchanging intercontinental cookie recipes. Let me tell you, the self-proclaimed king of kings and lord of lords is giving them instruction. Just like the Bible says, that city, that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth, and the American people should be outraged any time an American president even thinks to go to Rome. The American people don't comprehend. They just don't want to believe what is plainly evident before their eyes. Our government is in abject rebellion against the people who established it. We, the people. And they now serve one single man. That's what makes this Roman Empire so unique to all the other Gentile empires that preceded her. The Greek, the Medo-Persian, all the way back to the Babylonian. It just makes too much sense, doesn't it? Shall we turn from it? Shall we turn from the obvious truth because it's just too ugly to look at? Shall we close this book of Daniel, this book of Revelation? Shall we close our Bibles and just pretend that this isn't so? Or shall we take up the sword the word of Almighty God that cuts in both directions and fight this Roman Antichrist. I'm not suggesting an armed uprising. You can't win a physical battle with Antichrist. He overpowers you. We are not to be killers. God said, thou shalt not kill. Why? Because that characteristic defines Rome's history, all of it, from pagan Rome all the way through the Rome, the Holy Roman Empire. Inquisitions, crusades, mass murders, uh, ethnic cleansings, on and on and on. The world is literally soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus at Rome's hand. No, our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual They're biblical. And do you realize that this sword was wielded by Protestants in in the 1500s? Mary, a shot had to be fired. All they had to do was show the people from the Scriptures that the Pope fits the prophecies of Antichrist. And once they saw it, they rebelled against the governments. They overthrew their governments. They established constitutional governments that guaranteed the people's rights the rights which the papacy denied, the right to read the Bible and to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience, the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. So the Vatican went to war against the Bible. They tried to burn all the Bibles. And when the people wouldn't quit printing Bibles, they started to burn not just the Bibles, but those who read it. Isn't that what's coming to this country? The psalmist said, there's nothing new under the sun. We all know history repeats itself. That's a biblical concept. Should we, any of us, rightly expect anything different from Rome than what she has displayed for the past 1,500 years? 
it's comfortable for Americans to sit, read the paper, watch the news, and see all these ethnic cleansings, all these wars and rumors of wars taken. Well, it's not here. We're safe and sound. But let me tell you, the beast is ready to make war right here in terra firma, USA. For the first time in American history, we're not going to be exempt from bloodshed on our own turf. And guess who's going to be taking our lives? Our government, with the support of the papists and the ecumenicals who have joined ecumenically post-Vatican Council, too. It's going to be Christians destroying Christians. You know what they're going to call us? Radical fundamentalists. They're going to call us domestic terrorists. Why, anybody who would condemn the American government and criticize our wars and and denigrate our military, our soldiers who have bled and died, they need to be routed out of this country. Don't you see it? It's coming like a steamroller. You can turn your back, but you can't deny the rumbling beneath your feet. You better get out your sword. The word of God. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. That cuts to the marrow of the bones. Only sanity can restore this country. Only biblical sanity can restore this country. Only a comprehensible understanding of Bible prophecy, of the book of Daniel and Revelation, can save this country. Because only in the Bible is the reality of the truth available. It's just a a hideous reality that we cannot deny any longer. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I just want to round this point up by quoting John Wycliffe, who said, quote, The Bible is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Think about that when you next read the Constitution, and then check your daily newspaper and make a little bit control of how much of that Constitution still is in working. We will now go to characteristic number four that identifies the Antichrist biblically. biblically. And that is called, the Antichrist will have his church and state sit on seven hills. Again, we read Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, quote, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, end quote. Now, before I define these seven heads, I would like to remind you that I'm not giving my quote-unquote private interpretation. Very, very important not to do that of this prophetic symbol. The word of God states we are never to do this. Look up 2 Peter 1, verse 20. According to Revelation, that beast the woman is sitting on that we already find as the Vatican Church and State conglomerate will have seven heads. But how does prophecy define those seven heads? Look just a few verses lower to find out. The angel that is showing John this vision actually tells him point blank what those heads actually mean. Quote, And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. End quote from Revelation 17, verse 9. Looking into the strong concordance, how is that word mountains defined? In strong concordance number 3735, a mountain is defined as probably from an obsolete oro or to rise or rear. Mountain, mount, or a hill. So the word mountain can also be translated out as a hill. Is there a church and state? Church and state sitting on seven hills somewhere on this world? 
a lot of people, and this is not in the text right now, but a lot of people say, well, Jerusalem also is on seven mountains, and this city is on seven mountains, and that city is on seven mountains. But there is not one city that combines church and state sitting on seven hills. Continuing with the text. A quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia, page 529. Quote, It is within the city of Rome, called the City on Seven Hills, that the entire area of the Vatican State proper is now confined. End quote. And another quote from geographyabout.com website answers the query, what are the seven hills of Rome? Rome is known to be built upon seven hills. Rome was said to have been founded when Romulus and Remus, twin sons of Mars, ended up at the foot of the hill Palatine and founded the city. The other six hills are Capitoline, the seat of the government, Quirinal, Vimino, Esquiline, Syrian, and Aventine. And the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us on the query, the seven hills of Rome in Italy, quote, group of hills are uh, on or about which the ancient city of Rome was built. The original city of Romulus was built upon Palatine Hill, number one, Latin, Mons Palatinus. The other hills are the Capitoline, Quirino, Vimino, Esquiline, Syrian, and Aventine, known respectively in Latin, and I don't want to give you all the Latin names here because they are not uh, of that much importance in our reading here but you understood the seven names of the hills being given. <clears throat> Interesting, a little remark from myself now, to see that Romulus and Remus were the sons of Mars. Mars, the red planet, the planet of war, the god of war in the pagan Rome was Mars. <laughs> and another interesting diversion from that when you go into the book Rulers of Evil by Tapper Saucy on page 160, and you read about the history of the Rothschilds, who were defined in the British Encyclopedia as the guardians of the Vatican treasure, the guardians, not the owners. The company they formed was called Meyer, Amschel, Bauer, Rothschild und Söhne. Meyer, Amschel, Rothschild und Söhne. M-A-R-S. So they have the initials of Mars in their name. And they have a red shield because Rothschild is German for red shield. And those were also the shields the Roman soldiers in pagan Rome <coughs> defended themselves with when they went into battle. You know, you had a sword and a shield, and that shield was red. So there is a lot of history for you to study next to what we are telling you right here. But I'm going to go reading on the text. Understand now first that Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 tells us this beast will be, quote unquote, diverse from all kingdoms. How diverse, you ask? As we define the prophetic symbols, we understand this woman that is sitting on the beast is actually a church and a nation combined. Well, Tom went deeply into that just the chapter before here. It is what Daniel said. There will be a kingdom that will arise that will be totally different than any other kingdom that ever existed on earth. The Vatican fits this perfectly. Never was there a nation that was both a nation and a church at the same time. Never. And even if there was, did it have seven hills to sit on, as we see Rome, Italy, has been, has been doing since, the incept since its inception? Do a search online for seven hills, and you would see numerous pages with maps of the city of Rome. That's right, Yerk. And all throughout Rome's history, it has been known as the city on seven hills. It has also been referred to, even by Romans, even by the papacy, as Babylon. Now, that ought to tell you something. But I'll tell you something. I got a list. I got a, a an email from a listener the other day, and uh, she said she was a long time listener to my program, Inquisition Update, and that she agreed that the Bible is describing Rome. That is until somebody told her 
that Mecca, the religious center of Islam, is also located on seven hills, or rather seven mountains. She says, no, they're not just little hills like Rome. These are big mountains. And then she inundated me with all kinds of information that seems to point to Mecca as being this latter-day Babylon. But I would ask that listener, is, is Mecca, is Mecca a city, a church and a state? that reigns over the kings of the earth? Is Mecca decked in scarlet and purple, the colors of the bishops and the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church? Does Mecca have a golden cup in her hand? The Eucharistic cup of the Roman Catholic Church, an icon that Rome has established to represent herself, a a woman with a golden cup in her hand. Anytime one looks upon that image, a woman with a golden cup in her hand must recognize it as being Rome because Rome has taken that icon to represent herself. Who is spreading these lies about the Antichrist being a Muslim and Mecca being the Babylon of the Scriptures? When was it ever in the history of Christianity believed that Mecca was anything? Islam wasn't even created until the 6th century. Is Mecca guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus and all the slain of the earth? Or is Rome? How can one believe these lies? How can one carry the Bible in his hand and believe these lies? Who's spreading these lies? I'll tell you who it is. One of them is Walid Shubat. Walid Shubat. He's been. He's had several in, uh, opportunities to testify before Congress. He goes about the whole United States universities in Canada and the United States, saying that the Antichrist is a Muslim. Walid Shubat himself was a Muslim as a kid. He was the grandson of the the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a bosom buddy of Adolf Hitler. Husseini was his name. And Walid Shubat grew up under the tyranny of Islam. And he was a bomber for Islam, killing Israeli Jews. And then all of a sudden, one day, he says, God revealed that the land belonged to the Jews. But guess what? Walid then uh, was obviously, one might expect, that if he believed that the land belonged to the Jews, as he says, was disowned by his family, and was his very life was threatened by his own family, his father and his brothers, went on a hunt to kill him. And he came to this country, and he married a Catholic woman. He came to this country to escape the sword of his own family, and he married a Catholic woman. He's not a Christian. He's a Roman Catholic. He serves his Pope. Now, who better than a Roman Catholic to shed the onus of the Antichrist away from the papacy, away from his church, and onto a false antichrist a muslim one that cannot be described as a woman with a cup in her golden cup in her hand who it cannot be described as a church and a state which cannot be described as 
seated on seven hills, which cannot be described as being decked in gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, and arrayed in scarlet and purple, the very colors of the Roman papacy. Walid Shubat is a liar. Walid Shubat is a papist liar. Walid Shubat serves Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. And Walid Shubat needs to go back to Islam or repent and serve Christ and quit deceiving God's people. And Walid Shubat is only one of hordes of disinformation specialists that are about going about this country, invading discussion groups on the Internet, invading and interrupting true biblical knowledge on Inquisition Update and Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio and other Christian sites on the Internet. They will not allow the truth to be spoken. Lies define her. Murder and bloodshed define both Roman Catholicism and Islam. But we should not be deceived. The Bible speaks of Rome and Rome only. Or Daniel and the Bible is a liar. Four beasts upon the earth, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. There's not a fifth one for Islam. There's not a sixth one for, I- for Israel. The Jews are not ruling this world. The Muslims are not ruling the world. Roman Catholicism is ruling the world. The, the Vatican, the papacy is ruling the world. Stop listening to the liars and the father of lies. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I think we do not need any more explanation about the role of Rome in prophecy as stated here in Daniel and as stated, of course, by you. So I will turn to characteristic number five of the 26 characteristics of the Antichrist from remnantofgod.org, a website run by Nicholas that I, every listener here in the chat room and everybody listening to the video that will be made later on of this broadcast should look into. <clears throat> this site is a real great source of knowledge if you do study in the Roman Catholic Church into the New World Order and everything that is uh, about it, certainly from a Christian point of view, from a King James version point of view. <clears throat> Characteristic number five. Antichrist is to rule the world for 1260 years. We turn again to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, this time. Quote, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. End quote. But also Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, speaks of this time frame. Quote, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three, three score days. End quote. And the repetition in Revelation 13, verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. End quote. Now, Revelation 13, verse 5 speaks of this time as forty and two months. These forty two months of Revelation 13, 5, and the quote, time, times, and dividing of the time of Daniel 7, 25, equal the exact same thing. Forty two months actually equates to three and a half years. Looking closely, one can see this. Time, one year, and times, two years, and the dividing of time, plus half a year. That's a time, and times, and dividing of a time, which equals three and a half years, or 42 months. 12 plus 24 plus 6 makes 42 months. Revelation 12, verse 6 confirms this calculation when it says that the church of Jesus will hide in the wilderness for exactly 1260 days, 42 months, of three and a half years equals 1260 days. 
Now, still, some will say that 42 months does not equal 1260 days because all our months do not equal 30 days each. The fact here is, prophecy speaks of biblical months. And remember, we are not living under biblical time frame. We are living under Roman time frame. Some worship time frame. And biblical months are based on the moon and not on the sun. To understand the 40 and 2 months of the time, the times, and dividing a time that the beast will reign, we must first find the method of time the Bible declares for prophecy. Looking in Genesis chapter 11, verse 11, uh, verse, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, we find the Bible says the reigns of Noah started on the 17th day of the second month. Remember the date. In Genesis 8, verse 3 and 4, we find the water receded at the end of exactly 150 days. And then it says the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month. That is exactly five months to the very day. If we divide, divide the 150 days by five months, we will get 30 days per month. So 42 months multiplied by 30 equals 1260. And again, when you look at Revelation 12, verse 6, it confirms the calculation to be valid. It actually says the children of God will be hiding in the wilderness for exactly 1260 days. There is a very interesting documentary in three parts on YouTube that you can watch to confirm this. And this is called <clears throat> Israel of the Alps. And that deals with the Volgenses and their hiding for these 1260 days in the northern of Italy or south of what today is Switzerland. However, we are not done. A day in prophecy actually equals a year. That says in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, quote, I have appointed thee each day for a year, unquote. And in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, it says, quote, after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, unquote. So according to Ezekiel 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, verse 34, that's 1260 years that papal Rome would reign, and during this reign it will kill many Christians. And yes, some will say that this is just my opinion or interpretation. They would say that the only way this quote-unquote day for a year idea can be valid is if history proves it out. So, does it? Because today we have history to look upon to see that prophecy has been fulfilled. Well, first we need to find out when the Roman Catholic Church became a quote-unquote woman on a beast and capable of ruling in both the political as well as religious realm. Why? This is when she has her full power according to Revelation. And this brings us, of course, a little bit back unto the first reading of the characteristics of Antichrist with the three nations that were plucked out by the root where already was stated that the papacy well rose to full power in 538 AD. A quote comes from the History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. Quote, Vigilius ascended to the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. End quote. Historical records reveal the papacy began its reign in 538 AD upon Emperor Justinian's decree and under the military protection of Belisarius. And the Bible says the beast will rule for exactly 1,260 years before receiving a mortal wound. Now, it's just a matter of simple mathematics. It's also a grand method by which to see the Lord glorified. If the prophecy is correct, 1,260 years after 538 AD, the beast must receive a mortal wound. Did this happen? Can prophecy be that accurate? If you add 1,260 years to the beginning year of the Roman Catholic Church of absolute power as a church and state in 538 AD, you will arrive in the exact year 1,798 AD. <coughs> Excuse me. So according to the prophecy, we are told the first reign of the beast will last until the year 1798. So did it end in 1798? And if it did end then, how? 
quote from Encyclopedia Britannica, 1941 edition. And now this is very important that I read to you what year this edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica comes from. Because all the encyclopedias, all the libraries, all the study books, all the history books, everything has been taken over by the Jesuits, starting with the Rockefeller Foundation in the early 1920s, when they took over publishing companies and all that stuff. And the farther you get back in history and find an encyclopedia, the more accurate it will speak to true history, because history books today have all been falsified. But now let's turn back to the quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Quote, In 1798, General Berthier made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. End quote. That is exactly 42 prophetic months, or 1260 years, or a time and times and dividing a time, after the papacy began its powerful reign, that the Pope, quote unquote, shall go into captivity, by the military. This not only confirms the quote-unquote day for a year issue, it also glorifies the Lord like no other prophecy can. It is that accurate. One more thing must be brought up here to further validate the day for a year issue in prophecy. Looking at the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, one must realize that after studying up all the factors of the prophecy and the events that happened within those 2,300 days, it is highly impossible to have occurred over such a short time. This is what the general rule of thought is today, that the day for a year issue is a lie, and it was 2,300 literal days and not years. So is this true? Was it only days and not years? To quickly touch on this, I will only mention in passing what the student of prophecy is already aware of. During this prophetic period of 2,300 days, we see three global governments coming to power, one at a time. The two-horned ram, that represents Medo-Persia, the he-goat, that represents Greece, and the little horn, that represents Papal Rome, must defeat all their global enemies and then sit in power as a worldwide ruler, individually during this 2,300 prophetic days. If the 2,300 prophetic days are actually 24-hour literal days, as some theologians suggest, then all these global entities must do all that they did on a global scale within six years and 3.8 months. Think about that for a moment. Neither Persia must become a nation, defeat all the global enemies, and then sit as a worldwide power over all peoples, nations, and tongues. Then Alexander the Great must run rampant across the globe for Greece, and he too must defeat all the enemies. Then they they too must sit as a global ruler for a time. Then the Roman power, after the pagan Rome falls, of course, which is now ruled by Pedro Rome, must defeat all its enemies, and it too must then take the seat as the undisputed global governing power for a time. And all of this happens in less than six and a half years, even an atheist opening history book will tell you that simply didn't happen. But if you look at it over the course of 2,300 years, as the prophecy perfectly predicts, then, yes, it's perfectly in time and proves the prophecy sure. By the way, this prophecy also confirms the next prophecy. Revelation 13, verse 3, declares that this beast will receive a mortal wound and the end of its reign of terror. And in 1798, this truly happened right on time. This concludes the reading of the first five, and in this broadcast, first uh, number three, four, and five, characteristics of the Antichrist based on Bible study. And be sure that you have the KGV and not another corrupted Bible at your hand when you do this. I am now very glad to make turn over the microphone again to Tom, who has surely something very interesting to say about this Bible prophecy and this characteristic of the Antichrist. Please, Tom, share a little with us. Isn't it amazing? God gives a prophecy... And when it is fulfilled, 
it becomes history. So how do we accurately know when a Bible prophecy has been fulfilled, when we see its fulfillment in history? There's one thing that many people don't understand. God didn't give us Bible prophecies so much so that we would be able to accurately predict the future. God gave us prophecies so that once the prophecies are fulfilled precisely and perfectly in history, as we've just read, we can have faith in the Bible that cannot be conquered. And no more so do we have faith in the Bible than the literal fulfillment, the precise fulfillment of these prophecies. This 1260 years were fulfilled perfectly and exactly and completely in history, documented history, cited by the most respected encyclopedias in the world. Now, when did the prophecy begin? It began when the woman that was the church, the Roman Catholic Church, was seated upon the beast. Without the beast, she's not complete. She cannot fulfill the prophecy. She must be seated on the beast. And what does the beast represent? If the woman represents the church, as we've seen in prophecy, then the beast must represent a a government, a kingdom. Uh, and, And it must carry with it the authority of a king. Beasts in the Bible, Daniel defined what a beast is in Scripture. And if we deviate from his his definition of a beast, we have lost understanding. A beast, according to Daniel, is a king and a kingdom. Okay? Every king cannot be a king unless he has a kingdom, right? So they go hand in hand. And the kingdom and the king exercise civil power, governmental power. The church alone has not the power to control the government. But a church that's seated upon the beast, united with the beast, and in control of the beast, certainly if she's seated upon it, she has control of it, doesn't she? Common sense dictates then it is a union of church and state, and the woman controls the state. And that literally defines the Roman Catholic Church state. The only candidate to fulfill this prophecy in all of world history is the papacy. It's unique in all the world, just like the Bible predicts. Diverse from the first and breaks up the world and stamps it in pieces. And she, once she was seated, seated, this woman was seated upon the beast, then the image was created. The biblical image of this church-state union was created. The papacy, or rather the Roman Catholic Church, literally became not only a religious power, but a civil power. And if you mark that day down in calendar in 538 A.D., if this prophecy is to be fulfilled perfectly, you can count ahead 1,260 years and see if the woman was taken off of that beast, if the church lost its civil power, its power to control the governments of the world. And that's exactly what we see in 1798. She who killed by the sword must be killed by the sword. He that brought into captivity God's people must be taken into captivity. Exactly as prophesied. 
exactly 1,260 years later, in 1798, Napoleon's general, Berkier, walked into the Vatican and stripped the papacy of any more civil power and took him into captivity by the sword where the papist, where the Pope died in captivity. Isn't it a marvel that God has not left us ignorant to the fulfillment of this prophecy in history, documented, undeniable, indisputable history. Now, if you accept, as I do, as Yerk does, as Walt does, as anybody who is understanding the scriptures and history, if you agree with us that these 1260 days are fulfilled, then what do you say of someone who preaches another 1,260 1, days? He's a liar, isn't he? Is God the author of confusion? Are there two, two 160-day prophecies or just one? I'm told by a very, very uh, knowledgeable and popular Bible student and author that from the signing of a peace treaty and the proclamation of the Pope as God on earth on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, 1,260 literal days later, Christ will come. That makes him a date setter, doesn't it? It also makes him a liar because these 1,260 days have already been fulfilled in history just exactly the way God gave them. First, the woman was seated on the beast. 1,260 years later, the Pope, the woman was taken off the beast. A mortal wound was inflicted upon the papacy. The papacy cannot rule the world without control of the civil power. Fulfilled in history. So who is he who says that from a, the occurrence of such and such a thing, 1,260 days later, literal days, Christ will return? He's a liar or deceived. I'll give him that much credit. The least that can be said about that man is that he is woefully deceived. And yet he has great following. You know why everyone's deceived by people like this? Because the Jesuits have taken this history out of the encyclopedias today. They have taken out of our history books the fulfillment of this prophecy. So if you take it out of history, you cannot any longer see that Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. So if it has not been fulfilled, then it prepares the way for a false prophecy. And this is just exactly what they did with Daniel's 70th week. Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease three and one half years after his anointing in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Three and one half years later, in the midst of the week, the 70th week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. And God ripped the veil of the temple. If you study, if you study Jewish law, the Mosaic law, that veil had to be in place. It had to be in place or the high priest of Israel could not enter the sanctuary, could not enter the temple and make atonement for the sins of Israel. With that veil out of place, with that veil ripped from top to bottom, indicating that it was God who ripped it, then the sacrifices and oblations ceased. Any priest who entered that Holy of Holies with that veil not intact would have been killed 
according to the Jewish law. And at the very time that Jesus gave up the ghost and said, it is finished, the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. At the very time when the high priest of Israel was making sacrifice for the sins of Israel to make atonement for the entire nation. Isn't that stunning? How Jesus perfectly fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel? And of course, someone would say, well, Tom, there's three and a half years remaining. Yes. Then Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, continued to confirm the covenant that he confirmed with his own blood. How do you confirm a covenant? You fulfill it. Jesus did it in the midst of the week. He fulfilled it, the covenant, in his blood, in the midst of the week. It's perfect. And for three and a half years from that point, the Spirit of Christ continued to confirm that covenant through the Holy Spirit-filled apostles and disciples testifying to the people, testifying to the Sanhedrin that Jesus was the Messiah. He became sin for us. He died for us. He paid our price. And he's no longer in the grave, but sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he's been seen among us. Thousands of us have witnessed him. Multitudes saw him ascend into heaven. Multitudes saw the graves opened and the saints came forth and testified. And finally, Stephen, who testified for the last time at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, at the very end of the 70th week of Daniel, the prophecy that pertained to the Messiah, to the Jews, and Jerusalem, was coming to an end, Stephen finally convinced the Sanhedrin that Jesus, that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And the Bible says they ripped their clothes. Why do you think they ripped their clothes? Because the Holy Spirit, through the testimony of Stephen, convinced them beyond denial that Jesus indeed was their Messiah, who came right on time at the end of the 62nd week, which we understand there were seven weeks before that, so literally it was at the end of the 69th week, which makes it the beginning of the 70th week, right? First seven weeks, then 62 weeks, then one week. Nobody argues. Jesus' ministry was seven years, three and a half years in the flesh, Three and a half years in the spirit. The 490 years ended when the Sanhedrin, the government of Israel, finally admitted that they had slain their own Messiah. They indicated their understanding by ripping their clothes in agony. But what did they do then? Instead of getting down on their knees and repenting, we have wickedly slain our own Messiah. And then receiving him as their Messiah, they stoned Stephen to shut him up. But what has happened since then? Somebody has twisted that prophecy and said that it hasn't even occurred yet. They say, no, the 70th week of Daniel doesn't happen until the end of time, just seven years before Christ returns. And then not only that, but they say this 70th week does not pertain to Messiah. It pertains to Antichrist. And this Antichrist will sign a peace treaty with the Jews called causing the animal sacrifices to cease. But first, there must be a modern nation state of Israel. First, There must not only be a nation state of Israel, but there must be Jews living in the land. And not only that, there must be a temple. 
And then there must be some international agreement to allow the Jews to begin animal sacrifices again. Guess who has control of Temple Mount today? The Vatican literally obtained the deed to Temple Mount. Do you know that the Vatican has been has carved out within the old city of Jerusalem an enclave? Just like the Vatican, they have supreme and sole authority over that portion of the old city of Jerusalem. What is happening in this world? If God perfectly, if Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, why are we looking for a future one? And who is fulfilling that prophecy if God isn't? It's the papacy in cooperation with all the kings of the earth. They created Israel in 1948. They got Jews to move to the land by persecuting them. For 1,500 years, they persecuted the Jews. <clears throat> the First World War and the Second World War were a persecution, a pogrom against the Jews. Why would they not flee to Israel, even if they knew in their heart of hearts it was not God that was leading them to Israel. There were many Jews all over the world that said, we will not go to Israel. Not until our God delivers us, just like he did out of Egyptian bondage, by a strong right hand, by the Shekinah glory, and feed us, and clothe us, and keep us warm, and protect us from our enemies. Only then when we go back to our ancient homeland. It was he who cast us out, and only he can bring us back. And we will recognize him when he comes. We will not go to Israel. It's just an international ghetto for the Jews. You go to Israel, you will die. Because God did not bring you there. Someone else did. And those voices had to be silenced. Those voices had to be silenced. Are you beginning to comprehend what, what the Second World War was really about? And after all that dissenting voice was destroyed, only then could the Antichrist, the self-proclaimed vicar of Christ on this earth, with the cooperation of the governments, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, President Roosevelt, all of them. Churchill of England, all of them, in cooperation with the Vatican, to force those Jews down to Israel. And guess what they have prepared? Another temple. And all the Christian world is looking for this temple to be built when right there in their Bible, in black and white, in the clearest English one can speak, God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. And common sense dictates to us that Jesus was our lamb. There's no need for any more sacrifices. There's no difference now between Jew and Greek. Why? Because the Jews have to receive Jesus just like the, the Greeks do. So why do they need a temple? Why do they need a sacrifice when Jesus was their sacrifice? Aren't they sent down there now to eat and drink damnation to themselves? To perform animal sacrifices that can never take away sin? To eat and drink damnation and to prove once again that they reject the lamb that God provided for them? Who is teaching futurism that the 70th week of Daniel is not fulfilled in history but must be fulfilled in the future? It came from the Roman Catholic Church because even Roman Catholics read the Scripture and said, now listen, this description of Antichrist sounds a whole heck of a lot like the papacy itself. Am I in the church of Satan? Am I in the Antichrist church? 
And of course, when they question their priests and their past, and you know, their, their priests and their popes, why no? We're the vicar of Christ. We're the church established by Jesus Christ. The papacy cannot be the Antichrist. So it must be someone else. Well, you can believe either one. You can either believe it, that the Antichrist was Nero or Caligula or Alexander the Great, who wasn't even a, a part of the fourth and final beast, which is ridiculous. Or you can believe in an imaginary future one, but it can't be the Pope. Basic Roman Catholic teaching. The Antichrist is not the Pope. If Roman Catholics find out the Pope's the Antichrist, they're going to flee from the church, just like the Protestant Reformers did, when they realized from the Scripture the papacy and only the papacy could fulfill this prophecy. There isn't even another candidate in all world history. Common sense, if nothing else, prevailed, and they left the Roman Catholic Church in protest, and they still, what few of them remain in this world, still protest the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. The rest of them inviting to come to Congress to speak. Oh, my God, what is happening in this world? And how precious few people comprehend it. When the Bible leaves no room for doubt, history leaves no room for doubt. All of this future talk about a future Jerusalem temple, all this talk about Temple Mount, all of this focus on Israel is to keep you away from recognizing Rome ready to lop off your head right here in this country. There's no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, not unless Satan can counterfeit one. And isn't that exactly what he's doing? This is just too easy to understand. Why is it so complicated for people? Why do they doubt so? Because they've been lied to by wolves in sheep's clothing. Behind the pulpits of their churches, they're literally saying Jesus didn't come. Jesus wasn't the Messiah. The 70th week of Daniel has not occurred yet. Do you realize, do you realize, stop and listen to this. Comprehend what I'm telling you. If you do not believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, and that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you are tacitly saying Jesus was not the Messiah. And what does the Bible say? He that saith that Jesus has not come in the flesh is Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. He who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh, the same is Antichrist. He who denies that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and says it is yet future is of Antichrist. You denied that Jesus, that the Messiah came in the flesh. You may believe in a Jesus, but you cannot believe he was the Messiah because all the churches led by the Roman Catholic Church are teaching ancient Roman Catholic doctrine that Antichrist doesn't come till the end or that the Messiah doesn't come until the end of time after the 70th week of Daniel. Isn't it incredible how they have twisted the Scripture and caused the whole world to follow their lives? If you believe in futurism, you've literally denied that the Messiah has come. And what's the whole purpose of that? To get you to receive a false Messiah that the Vatican intends to present to you on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Because when, the, when somebody causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease in this phony, counterfeit, futurist temple in Jerusalem, the whole world will be irretrievably convinced that that, that man is the Antichrist. And once they have pinned the tail 
on the Antichrist and somehow done away with him. The world has recognized him as Antichrist and has rejected him. Then the door is wide open for a false Messiah. And I'm here to tell you right now, it's going to be the papacy. What a hideous reality. What a hideous counterfeit. And how easy it is to know the truth. Yet it is denied by Christians all over the world today. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. That was, as expected, a wonderful explanation of you of this last point, but also of the two points before that. We have come to the end of the broadcast. I asked already in the chat box if there are any questions, but probably uh, it's been empty for that, so <laughs> your explanation doesn't need any more questions afterwards. It's just great how you take the questions away the moment they arise in our heads sometimes, and the next sentence you answer them. For that, we were really grateful. Walt, uh, is there something that you want to say at the end of the recording right now? Do you have any comments? Uh, no. I, I think the explanation, I've heard Tom uh, explain the seventh week, but in, the t in, in, the, in one hour, I think this is uh, the, the easiest to understand and how simple it really is to understand the 70th week and what it means. Yeah, let's say you're as speechless as I am, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, for a radio broadcast when the host and the guest are speechless, and Tom is a little bit out of speech, of course, because that took a lot of him, um, then I would like to thank Walt for being on this call. Thank you very much for your support. Tom, thank you very much for being a guest. And I'd like to hear your farewell message to all of us because I love that as much as when I welcome you to the call to say farewell to us. So please, your final words, Tom. I would just simply leave the listeners with a blessing. Blessings in the one. Capital O. Blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Amen to that. So this will conclude our broadcast for today. We covered characteristic number three, four, and five of the 26 characteristics of Antichrist. And uh, in a short while, all these characteristics can be found as video uploaded on my channel, Jogla66 on YouTube. I very much welcome you to bookmark the page that you have been on and on and uh, listening to our reading and our broadcast here, because there will be future broadcasts on this format that we will do. And I also invite you to come to look at my YouTube channel, Jogla66, check out the videos I have there, and you can always contact me via a personal message or when watching one of the videos, make a comment, and if it's addressed to me, I will most certainly reply. I also want to advise you to go to the website of Walt Stickel, Grand Design Exposed, in one word, dot com. Also a very great source of information for you. And, of course, you can support Tom by going into Inquisition Update and uh, listen to his earlier book readings that he did. And uh, if this broadcast that we just did only seemed a little bit of interest to you, I can guarantee you, listen to his book readings will blow you away. So, thank you very much, Walt and Tom, for being here. Thank you very much for the guests in our chat room. And uh, I will be logging out right now in the name of Jesus Christ, who in, this, in whose name we made this broadcast, and to his honor only we give this broadcast. And thanks for the Holy Ghost being with us and leading us into the truth that we can bring it out to the people out there. Thank you very much, listeners, watchers of the video. Until the next time, bye-bye. God bless.